Hi everyone, I'm Michai here. In today's video, we're going to take a look at a package that's near and dear to my heart, the package throw. If you're throwing sessions anywhere in your application, then you definitely want to watch until the end because it's going to take your guard clauses or your various argument validations across your application, make them so much more concise and more readable. I do have two disclaimers this time before we start. So first of all, I'm a Microsoft employee, but I'm not talking on behalf of Microsoft. And the second one is that I am the one that wrote this package. So of course, I think this is the fastest library for doing argument validation out there. And it's the most extensible, it has the most features and so on. But make sure to do your homework and see what the various solutions that are available and choose the right one for your project before you introduce it to your code base. Okay, so I want us to first get familiar with this package, see what it looks like, get familiar a bit with the syntax, and then we'll look at it from a deeper perspective. Okay, so what we have on the screen is the name variable. We check if it equals John. If it does, which in this case it does, then we throw an argument exception. This is just to demonstrate a basic guard clause, right? So if we run this now, then we expect it to throw the argument exception, right? So as we expect, this is what happened. And we have here the string that we defined and we get here the parameter name, right? This comes from this for us to have an easier time to debug it. Now, what we can do with the throw library is we can say done it at package throw. Then we can take this entire thing, comment it out and replace it with simply saying throw if equals, yes, this one, John. Now, if we run the application, then we should get the same thing. And yes, we get here again an argument exception. We get here the exception message. Same thing like before. That's because I purposely chose this string to be the same. We get here the string comparison type that was used when comparing the two strings. And also here, this is the funnest part of this library where you get the parameter name for you instead of you having to specify it like we did over here. Now, many times, you'd want to customize the exception that's thrown, right? So over here, basically we can do whatever we want. We can add whatever lines of logs that we want. We can throw a different exception. We can change the exception message, right? You have all this customizability that you have by simply writing everything. So luckily using the throw library, you don't have to compromise on any of those. So you can do any type of customizability that you want. So starting with the exception message, then over here we can put here whatever custom message that we want. And now if we run it again, then we expect this string over here to be replaced with our custom message. And this is in fact what we got. Okay, another thing you might want to do is customize the exception that's thrown. So you can do that by simply saying over here which exception you want to throw, right? So. I don't know, custom exception, all right? Let's say something like this. Now, if we run it, then we'll get the exception that we defined, but we're losing the variable name, right? Like we have over here. So luckily we have another overload for this throw method that has here the param name. And then we can use it over here. So we can say param name, yes, like so. Now, if we run the application again, then we get here both the exception message and over here we have the parameter name, right? For us to be able to use it in our exception message as we want. Okay, now something that I like about this approach is many times when you have guard clauses in your methods, then it's hard to group which guard clauses have to do with which variable. Where over here, what you can do is you can simply chain all your validations that have to do with one variable, one after the other. So the way this would look over here, you can have also if longer than, yeah, let's say two, or I don't know if contains some value, right? So yeah, something like this. And now these through three rules, it's very easy to see that they have to do with the name variable. And if you're asking yourself what happens with the customization, then basically over here, we define our customizations and it takes effect to all the following rules validations that we have. So this will be the exception that will be used for these validations. But we can always change it in the middle. So we can say, this is true for these. But for the last one, I don't know, I want to go back to the default. And then 
this basically takes us back to the default or over here we can say custom exception yes and then this is the message that will be used for all the following rules now this is especially useful for the following scenario so let's imagine we have some student and we have over here our student generator yes where this is just something that i defined where it basically generates this student for us so we can have some fun with it now what we can do is the following we can say student and throw and now all the rules that are available in this library are also available on all the nested properties the way this looks like is the following so we can say i don't know if equals and over here we can say yeah the first name equals john or if longer than the dot and over here yes for example something like this and so on now let's say two <laughs> so this throws an exception so dot net run and let's hope the last name is longer than two and great we got an exception we get over here an argument exception the string should not be longer than two characters we have over here the parameter which is just great to have out of the box without having to do anything so we have here the student which is the variable name but we also have over here the property that we were validating in our case it's this thing over here and this really helps to debug when you're trying to understand what actually happened what threw an exception and if you would write this one after the other in just the um, traditional way then of course it would be much longer and also what if you've got also a student and also a class and some other objects and you want to understand what rules have to do with the student and what rules have to do with other um, arguments so this makes it obviously much more concise another nice thing about this library is that it was designed from the bottom up to support nullable reference types what this means is the following if we change this to an explicit type then we know this can't be null because it's written like this and not like this right now if we go to our generate method this is where i'm just populating it with random details i change it to be nullable as well now we see that we get a warning if we look at the warning then we can see that the nullability of student does not match the not null constraint so looking at the throw method definition then over here we have disallow null and on our t value type we have a constraint over here that requires it not to be null and if we look at the method documentation which i'm sure everyone does then over here we have a remark which says that this extension is intended for non-nullable types for nullable types you want to use the throw if null extension method so let's replace this throw with throw if null and we can see that it we don't have the warning anymore so generally for this library to in order to use the extension methods you have two entry points throw for all the non-nullable types and throw if null for the nullable types and the reason is that you can't do any of your validations before you make sure that it's not null okay so as you would expect you have validation extension methods for almost any of the built-in types that the language has so you can simply click dot and <laughs> try to fill it with the appropriate thing for that type and like we said there are two entry points for non-nullable use throw for nullable use throw if null and the way it works behind the scenes is that this returns a validatable of type t and now depending on this t then you have different extension methods that are available for you so up until now we focused mainly on strings and over here you can see all the various extension methods that string has everything that you would expect more or less right with regex validations and you can also pass your string comparison for many of the methods because we're working with strings but you also have different uh, extension methods for different types okay so make sure to take a look at the documentation if you decide to use this library so i have it open over here and it has a very extensive documentation for each one of the types and what it has to offer what the exception message will look like and so on so make sure to take a look at what this has to offer okay the next thing i want to talk about is extensibility so you're using this library in your application you really like it 
but you have the same piece of logic happening again and again, and you want to have the same fluent syntax like you have over here, simply add your own logic. So let's imagine that you don't want the student to be funny when he's learning for his PhD, right? So you would like to write something like, if funny during PhD, let's say something like this. Okay, now looking at this student object, so we can see that it has the is funny property and also it has the degree type, which over here can be PhD. So how do we add this functionality to the library? Well, it's very simple. All you need to do is the following public static class validatable extensions. And what you want to have over here is the following public static ref. This is a bit cryptic, I know, but you only need to write it once and then copy from what you wrote. So public static ref read only validatable of type student. And this will be if funny during funny during PhD. Yes. And over here. Yes. Uh, this is it's correct. Let's change this to a non capital H. And for now, let's simply do over here. Throw. Okay, let's understand what we wrote. So we have over here, the method that we wanted to add. Now, because we want to have the same fluent syntax, then each one of the method works on and returns a validatable of the type that we're working with. In our case, it's a student. But because we want to be the fastest validation library, then we don't want to have all these allocations, especially when you have many guard clauses in each one of your applications. That's why the validatable object itself, if we look at it, is a struct. But because it's a struct, we don't want to copy the struct again and again. That's why we're always passing it by reference. So what we have over here is we're returning our validatable struct by reference. And we're also getting it by reference. And the in keyword basically says we're getting it by reference, but we're not allowed to change the state, change anything, have side effects on this object. Then this validatable object contains the actual object that we want to validate. And also it has some other stuff, which we'll look at in a few minutes. So now we have the value property that we can do whatever validations that we want. In our case, we want to make sure that he is not funny and studying for his PhD. If yes, then we're throwing here an exception. So let's run the application and let's make this fail. So let's say new student, come on. Yes. Thank you. Let's say let's wrap the variables. And let's add the names. Let's change this to PhD. And let's change this to one letter. So nothing throws. Right? Great. Okay, so we're running the application. And this line over here should throw. So yes, we get over here our custom exception with the message that we defined over here. So funny PhD students are not allowed. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. Great exception message. Okay, now you may have noticed the exception message that's used is what we defined over here. And that's obvious because we're simply throwing an exception. No one's catching it. So that's what's printed. But if we're looking again at the block over there of the validation, then I would expect it to behave the same like the other methods, right? So if either of these throws an exception, then it'll use the custom message, but this one doesn't. So how can we align the behavior with the library? So first of all, let's write it and then we'll look at how it actually works behind the scenes. So what we can do is we can say exception thrower and we can say throw and over here we need to pass it a few things that are accessible via the validatable object over here, right? This thing. So we can say validatable, yes, dot param name. The next one is the customizations. So validatable dot exception customizations. And the last one is whatever message that we want. In our case, it's yes, this thing. Okay. Now, if we run the application again, then we'll see that instead of using this exception message, then it uses the custom message. Okay. Now the way this actually works is when we call the throw method over here, 
then like we said it creates the validatable struct and in this struct we're holding some details that we'll need for later so we have the value itself which has in our case it's the student which we can use later to validate access the properties and so on we have the parameter name which we don't need to specify because it's captured using the c sharp 10 feature of the color argument expression and we have over here the customization so if we want to customize the exception message the exception itself the function that creates the exception and so on then it's stored over here then the exception thrower basically encapsulates the logic of behaving correctly based on the behavior that we want and that's how it works behind the scenes so if you want to add your own functionality this is how you do it and of course once you wrote it then adding more customizations is very simple right so over here we can have a number two and have whatever validations that we want based on the student property last but definitely not least is a very cool feature called only in debug so the way this looks is you can take the entire validation statement and say in the end only in debug and then what happens is that this will throw an exception only when you're running in debug mode so now if we run the application because we're running here in debug mode by default then this does throw an exception but if we run and we said that the configuration is release then this won't throw an exception and what's really cool about this approach is that it's actually won't even be included after the compilation if you're not running in debug so if we look at the magic then we see we have over here the conditional attribute which will only include it in debug mode okay and the reason why this works is because when the code here is lowered then each one of the extension methods wraps the previous extension method as calls to various static methods and because this wraps everything and this entire thing will be included only in debug mode then the entire line over here is being omitted okay so that's it for this video if you like this library then make sure to give it a star on github the person who wrote the library would appreciate it so that's it and i'll see you in the next one